All right, well, welcome everybody to the um, Passive House, Introduction to Passive House, a climate specific passive building standard in North America. This course is approved for one hour in continuing education units AIAHSW, GBCI, AIBD, NARI Green, Certified Green Home Professionals. Um, and something that we're doing new now is many of our courses will be approved for a certified passive house consultant. As well, it may be applicable to your local or state based design or contractor license. Uh, I am your moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I am the executive director at the Green Home. Institute. The Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. We have a huge thanks to our, our major sponsor, uh, Anderson Window, as well as uh, Panasonic, uh, Build Equinox, uh, Sun Intuitive, um, and as well as all of our members, sponsors, our donors, uh, board of directors, and uh, volunteers and supporters. We couldn't do it without you. All right, so with that, I'll be introducing our speaker here. Uh, Lisa White has been with the Passive House Institute US since 2012 and currently serves as a project certification manager. She is also an instructor for Certified Passive House Consultant and the Woofy Passive House Software Trainings. Uh, White holds a degree in environmental sustainability with a minor in architecture from the University of Illinois at um, Urbana-Champaign. And she currently is pursuing her master's in energy engineering at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, so with that, Lisa, uh, take it away and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Brett. And just as Brett said, welcome everyone. Um, we will be talking about the FIAS Plus 2015 standard. That is um, FIAS's new standard, but it's not too new anymore. It's actually been around. Um, we released it formally last March, so March of 2015. Um, but I'm going to introduce you um, kind of to everything you need to know about the standard in a short amount of time. Okay. So the agenda here today is kind of what is this standard? Um, what does it mean? Um, next, I'll talk about the development of the different requirements and then how those requirements came about and then what the actual requirements are. Next, I'll get into the certification process and some statistics on the actual certified buildings we have out there. And then I'm just going to introduce you all to resources FIAS has. If you're new to passive building, um, potentially want to certify a building, I just want to introduce you to all the resources we've made available um, for the community. Okay, so starting off with what FIAS Plus 2015 is, it's really a performance-based standard with prescriptive requirements. So passive building, really we're looking at building performance. Um, we want to design buildings with low energy use, but also we want to design durable buildings that will last a while um, and quality buildings. Um, so we have this performance standard, but we also have prescriptive requirements to ensure it will be durable, it will last a while, it will be um, comfortable, um, et cetera. So it, the formal um, standard was developed in conjunction with Building America and the Department of Energy. Um, there's a, about an 80, 90 page report um, if you really want to get into more details. And really and everything I'm going to talk about today, we have probably five more hours of free webinars, which I'll, I'll show you, um, on the different topics, kind of digging into each topic a little bit more. Um, just as a heads up, there's a lot more detail than I'm going to go into today. Um, and if you want even more detail, dig into this report. Um, it shows you everything about how the standard was um, developed. Okay, so the FIA standard is recognized by the Department of Energy as the kind of top stair on this high performance staircase. So at the bottom, we have local code. Um, next, we have Energy Star. We have Indoor Air Plus, Building America, Zero Energy Ready Home, and then we have FIAS. So for most residential projects, all of these programs um, lower on the stair staircase are prerequisites for the FIAS program. Um, this applies to, again, residential projects and any projects that these programs can actually apply to. So 
passive building itself is really just defined by a set of passive principles. Um, these principles can be applied to any building, whether or not you're certifying to a certain standard. Um, these, build, these principles really just minimize energy use or are reducing energy use in a building. Um, so kind of the five main principles we talk about are continuous insulation with no thermal bridging, so kind of getting a nice insulated jacket on your building um, and reducing thermal bridging at any structural connections or any, any connections in general. Um, airtight construction, this plays a very large role in energy efficiency as well as building durability, uh, which I'll get into. So this is really critical for passive buildings. Um, optimized window performance and solar gain. So we're looking at window optimization and solar gain optimization and not just kind of like passive solar. We don't want all the gains. Um, we really want to optimize, get the solar gains when we want them, keep them out when we don't want them. Especially looking at the U.S., there are some climates where you don't want solar gains year-round. Um, so it's more of an optimization of solar gain rather than just welcoming all solar gains. Um, because we make the building so airtight, we now need to introduce balanced ventilation. And in order to save energy, we um, promote balanced ventilation with heat or moisture recovery, so using an ERV or HRV. And then lastly, the sum of all of these parts together really re allows you to minimize the mechanical systems. So we're reducing loads in the building and, and, and in turn adding a smaller mechanical system. So now we're going to look at, so we talked about the, the principles applied, but we really need to formalize it and make a standard out of it. So this is the requirements for the standard, just a, a top level summary. So we have space conditioning criteria, so it's a performance based. We have primary energy criteria, also performance based. Air tightness criteria, also performance based. These top three are really what I'm going to go into more detail today on and how they were developed. Um, these are the new criteria for the FIAS Plus 2015 standard. Um, the next three are the prescriptive, um, and prescriptive and performance, I suppose. Um, so we have moisture design criteria for assemblies and details. So essentially what that means is we want to ensure that you're designing your assemblies so that they will not um, rot or grow mold. Um, so we want the durable building assembly. Um, we have quality related prescriptive design requirements. Um, so this is like your, all of the on-site requirements like Energy Star, Zero Energy Ready Home, EPA and or Air Plus, and then also quality assurance requirements um, from the Rater Verifier, which are also those programs, the Energy Star and Zero Energy Ready Home. Okay, so that's an overview of the standard we're looking at. So now I'm going to start to talk about the development of the performance criteria. So we really have three pillars that we're looking at, and they're all pass-fail criteria. Um, so we have space conditioning, primary energy, and air tightness. So I'll go through each of these individually, let you know how they were developed, and then the resulting requirement. So when we talk about space conditioning, we're going to be talking about two different terms. Um, the first term will be an annual demand. And this is really the energy consumed over the year or the energy required by the building over the course of the year for heating and cooling. Um, so this is the energy delivered by the equipment to the space. Again, demand is over the course of the year. The other term we refer to is the peak load, and that is a space conditioning requirement during the worst case condition or the peak climate condition. Um, so we're looking at a worst case condition. Um, if you look at the unit here, this is BTU per hour, while demand is KBTU per year. So we're looking at, the load is looking at the worst case hour, and this will determine the size of the mechanical system. Um, so those are the two um, primary, or the two main space conditioning criteria we have. Okay. So the FIAS Plus 2015 standard was developed using an optimization tool called BIOPT, which was a free tool developed by NREL. 
essentially what this tool does is it creates, so you model a building and um, it adds upgrade packages little by little, trying to optimize the building. Each upgrade package costs a little bit more and each upgrade package reduces energy use a little bit more. So what we're trying to find really here is when we should stop upgrading, when we should stop investing in the building envelope or in better mechanical equipment, and when, um, when there's no return on investment in um, those upgrades. So we don't want to just keep throwing money at our envelope, keep adding inches of insulation, keep getting better windows. Um, if we don't think there's any payback on that, if maybe that, many, that money was better spent in PV or some other renewable energy source. Um, so what we did is use these upgrade packages to kind of find the sweet spot between conservation, so that's upgrading your building at the start, and generation, which would be investing in renewable energy. So this FIAS Plus 2015 standard is trying to find the sweet spot or the cost optimal or competitive spot on the path to zero energy. So our, our really our long-term goal is zero energy here. So we're trying to find out how much we can invest up front and how much economically really makes sense to invest up front in the building envelope and the, the mechanical systems in order to zero out our energy in the end. So what we were finding um, is that a lot of buildings were being designed adding way too much insulation where it just was not economical. Um, this is an example of a project I think certified maybe in 2011 or 12 um, where the last inch of insulation only saved 200 kilowatt hours annually. Um, after a certain point that insulation really wasn't saving any energy for the building and we don't want to throw money at that when we could use that, that money elsewhere in renewable energy or something else to improve the building. So we're trying to get out of that kind of diminishing returns. So what we're looking at here is uh, an output report from BOPT, the optimization tool that was used in this study. Um, specifically, this is for Chicago. Um, so the y-axis is energy-related costs, and the x-axis is site energy savings. So what we want is the lowest, or we want kind of the bottom right-hand corner of this. We want to have the most savings and the lowest energy-related costs, and then the right-hand y-axis is increased capital costs. So we really want the lowest increased costs with the highest savings. So that would be the bottom right-hand corner. So each of these dots on this chart is a different upgrade package that was done specifically for the test building in Chicago, Illinois. So let's look just at the blue line here. So we're looking at energy-related costs excluding solar. So we start and we have some sort of upgrade, and each of those dots becomes an upgrade package. Um, so we keep adding upgrades, keep saving on site energy until a certain point where this blue arrow is pointed, where it looks like the, there's a pretty sharp turn upward and in increased capital cost. So we're at 67% you know, saving, but the increased capital cost goes up after that point. So we're looking at this knee of the curve um, to determine the actual optimi optimized spot or sweet spot um, to stop investing in the building. Um, or stop investing in conservation, rather. So this actual study was done for, oh, I think it was 120 cities, as you see on this map, um, and that sweet spot was chosen for each. So what you would do is look at that sweet spot, look at the test building, look at the um, space conditioning demands and loads from that test building, and theoretically those are the optimized um, the optimized space conditioning targets for those locations. So again, this was done for 120 cities um, across the US, uh, across North America, actually. And with that data from the 120 locations, um, we were able to create a, a fit line and able to determine um, optimized targets for over 1,000 locations in the US and Canada. Um, so this is this kind of infamous FIAS map. If you have seen anything about FIAS in the last year or two, you've probably seen this. Um, each of these different dots or bubbles on this map have different space conditioning targets. 
Um, so each of them has a different target for heating demand, cooling demand, heating load, and cooling load. And that is all based on this optimization study we have here using BOPT. Okay, so with space conditioning, CS decided that we must meet all four targets. So I've talked about the demands. The heating demand is the heating energy used over the course of the year. Cooling demand is the cooling energy used over the course of the year. Um, heating load, again, the worst case heating. And cooling load is the worst case cooling. So those are determining your mechanical equipment size. Um, the reason that we require all four of these targets is because we believe they all have different advantages um, and there's a value to each of them. So low demands save energy over the course of the year, which also in turn saves money, obviously. And then the low peak loads ensure comfort, resilience, and again, reduce the mechanical system size. So we didn't really feel like we could drop off either requirement or do an either or. Um, we require all of it for this reason. Okay, so that's really how the space conditioning criteria came about. Next, I'm going to talk about the primary energy criteria. So again, to start off, um, the terms I'll talk about are primary energy, but I think it's important to address site energy before talking about primary energy. Um, so site energy is really the total energy consumed um, on site with everything. So we're talking about space conditioning, hot water, lighting, plug loads, appliances, anything in the building consuming energy. It's the amount of actual energy used, it, used on site, so like your electric bill. Um, there's no actual requirement for FIA certification for the amount of energy used on site. Instead, we look at the source energy or primary energy requirement. So we want to look at the actual source of generation for the fuel type used. Um, so in this description here, it's the same as the site energy described above multiplied by the source energy or primary energy factor for the specific fuel type used. So we want to know how much electricity or energy was generated at the source in order to use one kilowatt hour or one kbtu at the site. Um, so for example, electricity has a primary energy factor of 3.16 kilowatt hours per kilowatt hour. And that means every kilowatt hour we use on site used three at 3.16 at the source. So that is where the requirement comes in. And that's because overall we're looking at emissions, right? Overall emissions. So the requirements for primary energy vary by building type. Um, we have both residential and commercial buildings in the FIAS program. Um, the residential limit was based on a fair share of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so it became a per person limit rather than per square foot. Um, we believe this was fair and this also drove kind of building designs less into the mansion type design and more into a, a compact affordable um, shape. Um, so the requirement here is 6,200 kilowatt hours per person per year. Um, our original goal was 4,200 kilowatt hours per person per year, um, but that proved to be very challenging very quickly. So that will be our goal potentially for the next round of this iter um, study, um, but for now it's 6,200 kilowatt hours per person per year. And apologies if you look at the 6,200, this slash should be after the kilowatt hours, not between person and year. Apologies for that. Um, so down by 4,200, that's the correct way to show 4,200 kilowatt hours per person per year. Um, and then with commercial, we have a per square foot limit um, of 38 kBTU per foot squared per year. So for commercial buildings, because occupancy can vary quite a bit depending on the space type, we do have a per square foot limit. And in addition to this, there's an allowance for process loads on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so if you are interested in certifying commercial building, contact FIAS about the building type to see if you might have an allowance for process loads. Um, to come right back to this, um, the per person limit based on the fair share of CO2, the report goes into a lot more detail on this if you want to look at that, that long 
report or the webinars I'll point you to near the end of this, this webinar. Okay, and also the new standard allows you to include renewables to offset some of your primary energy use. Um, so essentially what we're saying is if you put up a PV array that can generate 10,000 kilowatt hours annually, you don't actually get to offset your primary energy use by 10,000 kilowatt hours. Um, you get to offset that by a certain percentage of that. So what we're looking for is coincident production and use. So is the, the energy being produced while you're using it? And if not, we assume it's either lost or back to the grid, but not actually applied to your primary energy reduction. So we have these different utilization curves based on climate. So what you look for is the annual output of the system versus your actual annual demand for electricity. So how much are you going to use over the course of the year relative to how much um, you're expected to generate. And based on that, you can figure out your utilization. And again, this will offset just as some of your primary energy use. So we've talked about space conditioning and primary energy. Next pass-fail criteria is airtightness. So the airtightness requirement for FIAS is 0 0.05 CFM 50 per foot squared. I realize it's not, it's shown in the middle of the slide here, but not large and bold. Um, the primary reason FIAS values airtightness is building durability. Um, that is by far the primary reason for air tightness. The secondary reason is obviously energy savings. But really we want to introduce less outside air into the building envelope and outside air carries moisture which can lead to vulnerable conditions in a, in a component or in, in an assembly. So we really want to cut down on infiltration and that's the primary reason for air tightness which is why we decided to look at envelope area rather than volume. Um, so, if you looked in ACH50, um, the actual leakage per square foot of envelope area varies quite a bit if you keep a, a consistent value for ACH50. So what I've shown here in this chart is with the 0.05 CFM50 requirement per square foot of envelope area, what the eight resulting air changes per hour would be depending on building size. So on the far left, we have a 1,200 square foot building. It would be about one air change per hour um, in the air tightness. But then if we go to the far right, if we have a 225,000 square, square foot building, we'd have about 0.2 ACH50. So the ACH50 varies quite a bit um, when you look at if you keep a consistent leakage through the envelope. So we're worried about leakage through the envelope, which is why we made our metric per square foot of envelope area. And this was um, developed based on a hydrothermal analysis by the tech committee. Um, so this was developed by CS's technical committee. Okay. So we've talked about what it is, how it was developed, what are the requirements. Now I'm going to talk about certification um, the process and statistics, and also, I think, a few more requirements. Okay, so what we see here is a summary table of the FIAS performance requirements. So, go through this quickly. On the left-hand side, you see the building type, single-family, commercial, multifamily, and retrofit. And across the top, you see the different performance requirements. So, we see heating demand and load, see cooling demand and load, air tightness, source energy or primary energy, and then renewable generation for source zero, which actually I'll talk about slightly later. It's an additional program um, for FIA certification. Um, okay, so in this chart, we can see that the heat, the space conditioning requirements vary based on the climate for each of the building types. That's the same for all building types. Um, air tightness is 0 0.05 CFM per square foot of envelope for almost all buildings. For buildings that are five stories and above with non-combustible construction, there is a slightly higher allowance at the moment of 0 
CFM 50 per square foot of envelope shown in the middle there in the multifamily um, line. So the air tightness is pretty uniform outside of these larger, taller buildings of non-combustible construction. The source energy demand is based on the building type, so residential buildings. Again, always 60 to 100 kilowatt hours per person per year. And commercial buildings are 38 kBTU per foot squared per year. If you have a mix of the two, then there is a mix of those two requirements. Um, there's a lot more information on this in the certification guidebook, which I'll show you later in this presentation. Um, but it's some sort of hybrid between the two requirements. And then it shows you what you need to meet source zero on the far right. And then the other requirements down at the bottom we talked about earlier, these are the prescriptive requirements and moisture design criteria um, that are required for um, just assuring a quality building. Okay, and then we've had a lot of questions recently about retrofit projects, so I just want to ensure I talk about those. Um, although it was shown on the previous slide, just to kind of break that apart, the space conditioning requirements, so all the demands and loads, are the same exact requirement as new construction. So we're still looking at that optimized sweet spot for the space conditioning requirements. The only difference is there's an allowance for existing structural thermal bridging. So there may be structural thermal bridging that you cannot mitigate and it's going to increase your heating load or heating demand potentially. We allow you to exceed the target by however much it increases those two um, criteria. The air tightness requirement we have is the same as new construction. There's really no, um, no giving on that because we're, we're caring about building durability. Um, primary energy requirement, same as new construction, again, and then the other requirements are the same as new construction, so those are the moisture design criteria. Um, but there's also potentially relief on some of the prescriptive requirements from Energy Star and DOE Zero Energy Ready Home. Um, that really, I think, is a case-by-case -case basis for those programs. So the certification process, um, might be slightly different than some other programs. We have a, really a two-step process. So we have what we call a pre-certification, which is a design review. So this happens early in the design, way before um, a project even breaks ground, ideally. Um, so the certified consultant will work with CS to, um, to pre-certify their building with the energy model, the plans, the specifications for the systems, appliances, et cetera. FIAS will review that design, and then after a couple rounds of feedback, it's a back and forth process, FIAS will say, okay, this is pre-certified. And what that means is if the building actually goes out and is built to those plans, to those specifications, meets all the on-site requirements, meets the air tightness, it will become certified in the end. So this is kind of an upfront check that you're on the right track or on track to meeting the FIAS Plus 2015 standard. So that is step one. Step two is throughout the construction process and also after final construction is complete, um, there's a FIAS plus rater or verifier that will go on site, um, perform many site visits, and ensure the project is actually being designed as built, ensure there's no red flag on site, um, look at insulation, installation quality, um, things like that, air tightness, preliminary blower testing, um, and those two come together for final certification. So a building cannot be certified until it is fully completed and both of these processes are complete. So we're kind of go into a little more um, on the step one here. The pre-cert design review um, includes Wolfie Passive verification. So Wolfie Passive is the screenshot you see here. This is our building energy modeling software. This is exactly where it will tell you after you've modeled your building, if you're meeting the VS Plus space conditioning requirements, those optimized targets per climate zone. Um, specifically here, we're looking at an example project, I think that's already broken ground in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I believe it's, let's see, o overall there's 274 units, I believe. So it'll be the biggest project in the U.S. once complete. Um, pretty exciting project going on. Um, but really the pre-cert 
stage is working with CS through a feedback process of developing details and getting everything approved through FIAS before construction starts. And then the on-site third-party verification. Um, like I said, there's different site visits that will happen. So you have slab insulation checks, um, looking for site shading studies potentially, um, air barrier details, doing a preliminary blower door test is critical to ensure that you'll meet the final blower door test. Um, quality of insulation, making sure ventilation ducts are sealed or space conditioning ducts are sealed. Um, hot water tests on efficiency of um, tank to tap. Then there's the final testing for ventilation, final air tightness testing, et cetera, and then final certification. Um, so it's, an, it's a very integrated process. So the certification process really starts back in the design phase and lasts all the way until the project is complete. So it's really important to know. So here I'm just showing um, the importance of our prescriptive requirements. So this is what the FIAS Plus Rater checkbook or workbook looks like. Um, it shows how we've integrated zero energy ready home and energy star requirements into our program. And it's an all-in-one checkbook, or sorry, all-in-one workbook um, that actually outputs the different checklists needed for the program. So the FIAS Plus Rater will come in and inspect all of this, and then they'll be able to provide all three of these, these certifications, Energy Star, Zero Energy Ready Home, Indoor Air Plus, I guess, and FIAS. <clears throat> okay, so getting a little bit into statistics, um, FIAS was really happy to release, it's been about six months now, earlier this year, but halfway through the year, we reached 1 million square feet of certified and pre-certified projects, which is a really big milestone. And we believe that we're getting, there's a, a very large uptake in multifamily buildings and larger buildings and affordable um, tax credits and um, incentives, which is really pushing passive building forward, which we're really excited to see. Um, so you can see there's a really, really um, tight, uptake and there's a almost vertical arrow which is going to be hard to meet in the next year. Um, so what we're seeing here is just a massive increase in square footage and we expect to be, I think we've already hit this projected, at, almost hit this projected at um, 130. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, so we'll be really close. So what we're seeing is just exponential growth in the passive building market which is great to see. And then to look at kind of um, the actual numbers here, um, at the top left we see certified and pre-certified square footage, kind of what we saw there. Um, so again, just exponential. 2016 is just booming um, with new square footage and we expect the same moving forward. Um, so the total count of projects, we have 364 total projects in in the FIAS database. Um, of those, 200 are certified and pre-certified, and 164 are just in the submitted process. So they're somewhere in that back and forth feedback with FIAS and the pre-certification. On the bottom right, we see a similar story, but now we're looking at pre-certified and certified units. So again, we see that exponential curve, um, a boom in 2016. Um, with pre-certified units, so a lot of these projects were actually submitted before 2016. It, they're just pre-certified and certified in 2016. Um, so total, we're almost at 2,000 units. We're about at 1,000 certified and pre-certified, and then about the other 1,000 are in process right now. So we, again, we continue to see this grow, and we expect to continue to see this grow. Okay, so lastly, I'm going to wrap up with some resources, and then we will have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, okay, so we'll get into some resources available for everyone. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the certification guidebook. Um, this is probably also about 80 to 90, 90 pages long now. Um, it really cr contains everything you should need to know about um, certifying a project or about designing a passive building. Um, it's really, really hopefully helpful for any certified consultant or a FIAS Plus Rater or FIAS Plus Builder. 
Um, it contains information about the FIAS Plus 2015 standard, just general notes and guidance on designing a low-cost passive building, for example. Um, it has all the certification requirements, process, fee schedule, and then energy modeling protocols that are specific to our standard and the Wolfie Passive Energy Modeling software. Um, it also has some appendixes that could be helpful, which explain how to use renewable energy um, to offset your primary energy. So how can you make your different renewables count? Um, moisture controlled guidelines for designing assemblies. So how to keep your assemblies out of risk for rot or mold. And then an update on how we determine the peak load formula for the, the space conditioning criteria. So this guidebook is a great resource if you ever want to certify a passive building. We also have a certified window data program. So we certify window data. We don't necessarily certify windows. So we will run calculations and certify data for any window. We're not certifying that that window is the perfect window for your passive building. Um, how that's taken care of is there are climate specific recommendations. If you look at the left hand certificate here, um, you can see these the colors of the different ASHRAE zones and then the check boxes where this actual window might be recommended based on its performance. So this one specifically is recommended for climate zone three um, for the south facing windows. So we certify any data and then we recommend this window is used in particular climates. Um, there's at least 12, 10 to 12 different manufacturers that have certified data with CS. Um, if any of you out there are certified consultants, you might know it's hard to find good window data sometimes um, or reliable window data. So this is a really helpful program that can get the manufacturer to certify their data with CS and then it's a no, no problem, surefire way to have accepted window data and comparable window data is probably the more important part. Um, so comparing apples to apples um, with the actual windows. We're also working on other product certifications. I don't really have any updates on that at this time, but you may see more of that in the near future. Recently also, FIAS developed a multifamily resource center. Um, so it, it does say multifamily, but really this could be used for any project. Um, it's really a developer center um, or anyone interested in passive building. So let me go into a little more there. Okay, so what we have on here is developer webinar series. So developers of these larger passive buildings that we're seeing have generously offered to share their experiences, um, ups and downs, things you should learn, et cetera, about the process, which we're really fortunate to have. And these are all available for free on our website. Um, I think there's about five different developers or developers webinars out there right now, and we plan to continue to have more. Um, there's also case studies for all of these buildings. Again, these are all multifamily buildings, but the regular FIAS website has all building types, commercial, single family, et cetera. Um, so there's a bunch of case studies, uh, lessons learned from the team, what are the assemblies, what windows were used, what mechanical systems were used, really um, just a great resource for anyone trying to design a passive building. Um, FIAS also has more free webinars, just in case anyone's more interested in everything I'm talking about. Um, so we have two hour long webinars about specifically just the certification process. So one is really on the pre-certification process and the other is on the QAQC or the on-site certification process. Additionally, we have other webinars specifically on how this FIAS Plus 2015 standard was developed. And they're going to go into details about the actual mathematics behind it and the optimization and really every detail of the standard. And that's laid out in these two webinars on the right, which are also on the FIAS webpage. I've, I've added links to the bottom there. Um, and I think it's two to three hours worth of content on how this standard was developed, rationale behind it, um, really everything you need to know. Um, FIAS also has a two hour consulting if you needed Really, if you're potentially borderline about certifying a project, you could um, you could talk to CS and say, I'm really not sure, I don't want to pay the certification fee right now, can, can you take a look? And what we do is we look at your project, look for red flags, look at your energy model, and kind of, I guess, lean you in one way or the other 
potentially if, if it looks like it could potentially meet the standard or not. So this is a way to kind of ease into the process as well at a low cost. Um, that's typically what that's used for. Um, we also have a feasibility study, which is used in the same manner, but pot potentially for someone who's not a certified consultant and can't run the energy modeling themselves. So it's a, basically you have this, you have a building design and you're like, what will it take for this to meet the FIAS plus 2015 standard? How can I make this a passive building? Um, so FIAS runs quick preliminary energy model and gives it back to you and says, this is what you need for envelope components, windows, uh, shading potentially, um, mechanical systems. And it, it kind of gives you a rough um, guideline of how you could steer this building to meet the passive building standard. So it's really just meant to inform the design and the project team of what they need to do, what upgrades would be necessary, and then you can assess if you want to take that route or not. So a couple years ago, um, back when the feasibility study originated, this is an example of a feasibility study in New York that um, came to fruition. So here it is on the right-hand side, up, um, the walls are up now, and it started as a feasibility two years ago. So they came to us, asked what would it take, said, oh, we can do this, it's really not that bad, it's not, it's not rocket science. So that's something we want people to realize. It's, it's not a huge jump, it's not, it's, it's supposed to be economically feasible now, which is the total intent of the FIAS plus 2015. It's not that it's going to be the exact same as code construction necessarily, um, but a lot of developers and project teams, experienced ones, I suppose, are finding that they can build these buildings at little to no extra cost because of the reduced mechanical system sizes. So there is an economy of scale there. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. It's really not far-fetched, which is the intent. We want widespread adaption of this, this optimized passive building standard. Other resources, um, Fraunhofer developed our Woofy passive energy modeling software, and we're still working with them to continue to improve that software. Um, we're partners with Building Science Corporation, and then we also have our technical committee, um, which is always developing new protocols, writing new technical articles, um, et cetera. And they are the ones that developed the FIAS Plus 2015 standard. And I believe that is it, and I'm early on time. Um, so I have plenty of time for questions. Um, at the bottom, you'll see there's a CEU code. If you're applying for FIAS CEUs or CPHC CEUs, that is your code to self-report. Um, I believe Brett will send out codes for any other reporting or send out information for reporting other CEUs. Thank you. Well, thanks, Lisa. Um, and yeah, real quick before we get to the, the questions, um, for those of you who are getting your certificates, um, please check your email or spam uh, here in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. You should be getting an automated email. Uh, make sure to take that survey, whether you need CEUs or not. And then there are some different reporting instructions for GBCI, AIA, and or FIAS. Um, for those of you watching on-demand, so I'm not talking to anyone here live right now, watching our on-demand session, um, complete the 10-question quiz with a 70% passing rate on whatever uh, system you're watching this on, and you'll be able to get your certificate and your CEU. So. All right, so uh, please, everybody, we've got a lot of time here for some questions, and we've got some coming in already. Uh, one of them here from Seth is, and I'm going to add a little bit to it, uh, Lisa. Um, okay. I guess overall, tell us a little bit more about the context of BOPT. If I understand right, BOPT still exists as a as a as a tool that can be used for free. Um, right. But but then the the question here is is how is BOPT gathering the cost information since it's widely variable by both location and the builder's buying power? Right. Um, so what's used, I believe, in the software are national averages. Um, so that is a factor, obviously, mm -hmm. but we kind of had to stick to national averages given the extent of the study. Um, so it is national averages. I believe that's updated. I don't know how often, um, but I can ensure it will be updated before the next iteration of the study, which I believe we're planning, probably planning to redo this study in 2018 as things change, um, potentially a three-year upgrade on our, our analysis. 
Is that? Uh, if there's more, if there's more questions, um, hopefully it'll come back. Um, so I guess it, it, so. It, it, it sounds like DApp though is is not a tool you're currently using. Um, um, Theus doesn't up. use it specifically. Okay. We used okay. it to develop the standard, mm -hmm. um, and it could be used on any given project. So any mm -hmm. consultant could run their building in Beopt and mm -hmm. do that optimization strategy specifically mm -hmm. for their project. But we used it only to develop those mm -hmm. cost optimized mm -hmm. targets. And then we use Woofy Passive to ensure the building um, is meeting those space conditioning targets oh. and performance criteria. So if someone does it in VOP, can it be, and forgive me, I'm not an energy modeler, but can it be That's exported okay. in some way so that um, the work they've done populates in Woofy, or do they? Connect? I do not think so. I don't okay. think the two are compatible. So the work would have to be redone, essentially, after? Yes. Yeah. All right. It's. I think it's really two different programs. Um, sure. That's in terms what of I the thought. Output. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this might take you back to one of your slides, I'm not sure, but the question is air tightness at air changes per hour, 50 building envelope, though shown as floor area in the chart. Um, so I'm not sure which yeah. chart that is, but yeah, define how building envelope is determined. Does it include square footage of all six sides of the envelope? Yes. So the envelope area that we're looking at for leakage is every single surface enclosing the building thermal envelope. So that's all, so you have a box, that's all four walls, the roof and the slab or the floor. So every single square foot of that exterior envelope. Um, what I've shown here is actually building floor area rather than building envelope area um, because people are more used to getting a feel for a building has, you know, a thousand square feet, 6,000 square feet. Um, rather than knowing how many square feet are of the envelope. So what I'm trying to show here is that as you build a larger building, if you keep the leakage consistent in the envelope area, the ACH 50 or the air changes per hour resulting in the air tightness actually gets lower. Although the leakage in the actual envelope per square foot stays the same. So this plot is trying to show a constant air leakage per square foot of envelope although ACH 50 varies quite a bit because that's based on the volume of the building rather than the envelope area. I hope that helps. Yeah, well, certainly if there's any follow-up to that, um, mm -hmm. I'll have, uh, hopefully they can reach back out because we still have some more time. Um, yeah, so we got more time for questions. Please put them in. I see a couple that are asking about some process stuff that I'm going to get to here in a second, but I just want to make sure that um that uh you know we get that this straightened out and, and that is to be to be sure to do a FIA certification project um uh you have to have a building that is certified under the department of energy's uh zero energy um uh, ready standard as well is that correct that is correct for mm -hmm. most residential projects okay. um so if it's a single family yes that's correct um, if it's a multifamily, it depends. If it's a, it, that we have a multifamily standard written specifically to this, but I believe if it's like above four stories, some of them don't actually require the standard, but the low rise all do. Um, but then when you get in a mid and high rise, the requirements are slightly different, but all single family and low rise residential do require that program, zero energy ready home. And is there anything uh, I guess on par with it in the commercial or high rise world that not at the like moment, okay. not at the moment. Um, in the mid rise buildings, we do typically ask that they fulfill the requirements of these programs, although they can't, they don't necessarily qualify or they're not eligible, but we still value the, the requirements and those checklists. Um, although they can't actually receive the certification, we ask them to follow it. Um, commercial, we don't have a formally written standard yet um, in terms of those types of requirements, but that is next on the list in process now. Um, another technical question coming in before we get to some of the other process questions. Um, am I correct that FIAS doesn't recommend construction type 2x4s, 2x6, 2x8, SIP, ICFs, or et cetera? Rather, uh, only says you have to hit a, these heating, cooling, air tightness requirements regardless of the method? That is true. Um, what we do require is that you design your, I guess in this case, wall assembly 
probably, um, so that it doesn't, it's not at risk of mold growth. And where you can find the requirements for that is at the end of the certification guidebook, we have these moisture design, con moisture control design requirements. Um, so basically says if you're in climate zone five and you're building um, a wall with framed construction and some sort of rigid insulation outside of that, the rigid insulation should be 35% of the total R value of that wall in order to ensure um, the sheathing is outside of risk of mold growth. So it's, it's kind of specific to your climate zone and the type of construction you're building. So we ask that you follow those, but we don't care outside of that as long as those are followed, what type of construction you choose. Great. Um, so getting into uh, 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 process here a little bit, um, mm -hmm. is it required that you have both a certified passive house consultant and a passive house rater on a project? And do either of those have to be third party or can they be employed by the builder or project team, if you will? Yeah, um, so the CS plus rater or verifier, which is the person on doing the on-site inspections, they must be third party, um, always third party inspection. So they are always the third party. Um, and a fees plus rater or verifier is required for all projects. Um, there's one contingency if there's no one certified or qualified within a two hour drive of the project site. So if you're in a very remote area, um, contact FIAS and we'll work with you to find a reasonable solution to keep costs down. Um, so typically, almost always, FIAS plus rater is required. And then a certified consultant is not necessarily required, though I don't think we've had any projects successfully certified that did not have a certified consultant on staff. You're going to need to know everything that a certified consultant needs to know, and you need to know the energy modeling. Um, so. It's not actually required by FIAS, but it's highly recommended and probably your best route to and I assume that's this whole project. Yeah, typically ahead. like an architect or designer that builds Yeah, it's typically an architect, engineer, or just energy consultant. Um, yeah, that's typically the profile. Okay, so with that, we've got this third-party verifier. We've got the most likely the certified passive house consultant. Uh, throw that in uh, as well as other uh, certification soft costs. Um, you know, what kind of fees are we looking at? And, you know, can you give us some, you know, just some high level averages maybe for single yeah. family, multifamily, or commercial buildings? Yeah, so um, most projects are coming in between 1% to 10% additional costs. Um, you'll find the higher end for maybe an inexperienced team a first time, uh, a lot of it's education and just getting over those hurdles of learning and doing everything for the first time always costs more. It's not necessarily just extra materials um, or better windows or that upgrade, it's, it's also the learning process. Um, multifamily, I think we're seeing a, a much smaller additional cost. I would say some have, like I said in the presentation, some have reported no upfront costs, um, no additional because of how much they were able to cut out, um, which is really exciting, but usually zero to 5% additional for multifamily. Um, I don't have a good feel for commercial yet. There's only a handful of case studies for those. I would estimate the same upfront cost, zero to 10% zero to additional cost um, in the construction budget. Now you're, and I'm glad you got the hard costs. Um, oh, and then um, soft costs, okay. And yeah, can you maybe, and maybe soft costs can be put in a way of, uh, you know, uh, per per unit or dwelling, and that's, again, considering the certified passive house consultant, the rater, the certification fees, um, you name it. Yeah, so um, fees for the projects vary by uh, square footage, so I'll use a single family example. Um, you're looking at between $1,300 and $1,800 of CS's fee. Um, so that's the design review, pre-certification, final certification. That's just FIAS. Um, your rater fee, we usually say is about the same as FIAS's fee. So you're looking at, let's say, 1500 from FIAS and maybe 1500 from a rater. And then um, the consultant is iffy. Um, it really depends on their scope of work. Um, most have a, an hourly contract and 
I, I, I really can't say um, how many hours that will be. I'm not sure. Um, but you're looking at about three, three grand probably, maybe a little more for a single family up to 4,500, 5,000 square feet um, of just the certification fees. Um, I, I'm not fully confident in saying the numbers for the consultants. Um, and potentially the writer could vary a lot too because that's a third party quote that's outside of thesis control. No, that's fine. Um, and so uh, from a cost standpoint too, does, does Theus allow or have any kind of uh, sampling protocols for multifamily buildings or? Uh, yeah, there are sampling protocols. Um, I believe it follows ResNet's sampling protocol. Um, I can send, at least I can send you, Brett, our multifamily protocol to document it. It, it clearly describes the sampling protocol. I can't remember the details offhand. Um, but there definitely is a sampling protocol, for example, for this 274 unit building we're looking at on the screen here. Um, you don't have to test every one of these units. Um, so there's definitely that. Yeah, that certainly gets cost down. Um, right. So, you know, and, and this is always a great question, um, but what are some of the benefits or incentives to actually certifying to passive house, um, you know, versus just following the uh, the guidelines and, and not and foregoing the certification fee and process. Right, um, I think the biggest uh, advantage is really third party review, um, third party oversight. So you have a different set of eyes review. We pretty meticulously review projects um, and look for red flags and really guide and aid the design team throughout the process. Um, so that's helpful. Um, there's also third party quality assurance and quality control. Um, so this rater on site is ex an extremely critical role um, in ensuring the building is actually going to perform as designed. So really anyone can put a building in an energy model and say, okay, it's gonna do this, but it takes a lot of focused concentration and effort to actually ensure the building can do that. And I think certification um, really is the, the best way to ensure that the building will por perform as designed. Um, that's probably the best incentive just in general um, for certifying the building. Um, outside of that, there are tax incentives for different affordable housing agencies in different states. Now the list is getting pretty long. Um, there's some in Illinois, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, I believe Washington, um, Offhand, I can't name them all, but um, different programs are incentivizing and writing in FIAS into their programs. Um, LEAD version four actually just wrote in um, FIAS Plus as I believe it's up to four, or no, sorry, up to 31 points for certifying to the FIAS Plus 2015 standard um, for your LEAD project. So there's different incentivization incentives everywhere. Um, kind of coming from all different sectors. And then also the, the Energy Star Zero Energy Ready Home programs also come with incentives and those are prerequisites to our standard. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great point too. And um, if anybody's looking, um, you know, clearly since DOE Zero Energy and Energy Star 3, uh, and I believe what Indoor Air Plus as mm -hmm. well, right? Um, our right. cornerstones to your program in the residential world um, we actually have some sessions on our website too, if any of you wanna take a look at those, cause you know, you'll have to get a, your head wrapped around some of those programs too, as a, as a bare minimum baseline, as well as if I understand right, uh, HERS index rating um, comes along with that too, mm -hmm. um, for the building. Um, so those are all requirements. Um, so that does bring up a good question. Uh, I mean, clearly, clearly passive house, you know, usually gets pegged from what I hear as a energy efficiency standard and ignores, um, you know, some other, uh, what we would call aspects of, of green building or pillars. Um, mm -hmm. But with the DOE program, I mean, you're really looking at the water management checklist for oh, durability yeah. and you're looking at the indoor air plus um, for indoor air quality. So, um, right. you know, it's really great to see that, that progress going in that direction. Um, I do recall at one point hearing that uh, the, the standard was taking a look at um, uh, foam and foam insulation and the global warming potential of it and trying to come up with some limits or ideas or resources on that. Has there been any um, any updates in that regard? 
there's no real development on that. Um, so we don't restrict the use of any foam, but when we do see a project come in with a lot of foam that has high global warming potential, we kind of just nudge the consultant or the designer to use um, a global warming potential calculator, which we have um, on our website, just to kind of give them a clear picture of if they're outweighing the consequences of, of that use of that foam. So we, we nudge against it, but there's no requirement for any type of insulation. All is accepted at this point in time. Sure. Um, great question from jo Josh here on the on the high rise. Is um, Energy Star multifamily high rise required? Um, not not at the moment. Okay. Um, it's not. So that was a that was thought of, but as of now, I believe it's only for mid rise. Mid rise. Um, okay. And on our website, there's um, on the certification page, there's like a documents to download section. I would recommend. You said Josh asked this to look at. Um, the multifamily protocol document there, and it specifically states when the Energy Star programs are required um, for any multifamily building. Um, and before we uh, wrap up here, um, as far as getting further resources and having um, everybody's asking where they can locate that uh, that manual, uh, mm -hmm. CS manual we were talking about, and how much that costs. Uh, that is free. The guidebook is free. Um, it's on our website. Um, <laughs> I can't show a web page, can I? Potentially, could I send it to you, Brett, and it goes in the follow-up email? Yeah, if you send it to me, uh, we'll we'll get it out to anybody who asks. Um, the follow-up email should be on its way already, but oh, okay. we'll get these different Apologies. links out. And then we'll also get it up on our website um, so people can access uh, both of these uh, reports that you, you referenced to. They'll be up on our website. Okay, so I'll, I'll get it to you um, and others. It, it is on our website for free under the certification page, and it's also on that or multifamily website I showed. So either fias.org or multifamily.fias.org. Um, it's on both of those. All right, very good. Well, um, we are now uh, just a little over our time. I think we've gotten to a majority of the questions. Uh, at least I really want to thank you for your time and thank the um, Passive House Institute U.S. for um, having you do this session with us here today. Uh, for those, again, looking for continuing education units watching live, uh, look for an email in your inbox or spam folder with all of the uh, um, things you need to do. And if you want any um, uh, email, if, feel free to respond back to that if you would like any of these links sent to you directly. Otherwise, they will be listed on our website. Uh, for those of you listening on demand, make sure to take the 10 uh, question quiz um, to get your CEUs and certificates. So, Lisa, again, where can uh, people learn a little bit more um, if they want to move forward? Yeah, so I would recommend going to our website. Um, there's a, an About FIAS page that has those webinars I pointed to in the presentation. Um, and also the multifamily.fias.org has quite a bit of resources too. Um, and my email is shown on this this last slide as well. It's just lisa at passivehouse.us, all English spelling. If you have questions on where to find something or just general questions, um, interest questions, shoot me an email and I'll get back to you about that. So hopefully you can find the webinars on our, on our site. Well, thank you, Lisa. Um, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, take care, everybody, and we'll catch you at the next session. Thank you.